Hello and welcome to UGC e Parshala. I am Dr. Srikar Lama, Assistant Professor in Criminology and Police Studies at Sardar Patel University of Police, Security and Criminal Justice, Jodhpur. I am going to present the module on investigation of unnatural deaths, robbery, dacoity, theft and housebreaking. The learning outcomes of this module are to make the learners understand the various steps of investigation of unnatural deaths, robbery, dacoity, theft and housebreaking. To familiarize the learners with various skills and techniques of investigation of unnatural deaths, robbery, dacoity, theft and housebreaking. Investigation of different offenses requires different techniques and skills. Investigation of offenses against persons and property, investigation of unnatural deaths, robbery, dacoity, theft and housebreaking require skills like interview skills and crime scene management. We will begin with the investigation of unnatural deaths. The investigation of cases of unnatural death is essentially an important function of the police as the general public in most of the cases frequently forward allegations of foul play and if the unnatural death occurs within the view of custody of the police, the things would become very serious. The unnatural death as defined under section 174 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 is that a person has committed suicide or he has been killed by another or he has been killed by an animal or by a machinery or an accident or the person has died under circumstances raising a reasonable suspicion that some other person has committed an offence. When the officer in charge of a police station or some other police officer specially empowered by the state government receives an information that a person has suffered an unnatural death he shall be immediately give intimation thereof to the nearest executive magistrate. The first information report empowers to hold inquest and to other officers as in the case of sending copies of the first information reports. Proceed to the place where the body of such deceased person is, make an investigation and draw up and report of the apparent cause of death. Describing such wounds, fractures, bruises and other marks of injury as may be found on the body stating in what manner or by what weapon or instrument such marks appear to have been inflicted. These proceedings are called the inquest. Proceeding under section 174 and 176 of the Code of Criminal Procedure which shall be conducted by the investigating police officer and the executive magistrate who conducted inquiry into the cause of death, guided by the questions given in form number 85, incognizable or specific substantial offences relating to the death of a person, in addition to sending a first information report, the inquest report should also be sent along with statements of witnesses recorded during the inquest, attested by five panchayats summoned under section 175 CRPC. It is of primary importance that the investigator learns the manner in which the victim died as soon as possible after the discovery of the body. Although much of the information is learned from the autopsy, much can also be discovered through careful examination of both the deceased and the crime scene. Forensic autopsy is frequently used to determine the cause of death and estimate the time of death, examine gunshot wounds, which helps in assessing the severity of gunshot wounds, estimating the distance of the shooter from the victim, determining whether or not the victim was alive before the shooting, establishing the type of gun used in shooting, examining wounds including defense wounds, etc. Apart from the forensic autopsy, investigators should look for fingerprints, biological evidence and trace evidences which will help in identifying the suspect. Interviewing witnesses, family members, relatives, friends, colleagues and neighbours in a proper manner may also provide investigative leads and narrow down suspects. CCTV footage around surrounding areas and call records of the victim may also prove useful in investigation. 
The duty of the station house officer holding such an investigation under section 174 CRPC primarily rests with him and he should unless precluded from other pressing duties hold the investigation himself. On the part of the circle inspector in the case of investigation of unnatural death cases, he shall verify the investigation of such cases at random and write a case diary for having verified it. Such case diary shall be called verification case diary and this shall be sent along with other case diaries to the officer of office of the superintendent of police filling the original in the station CD file, the report to be forwarded with the dead body to be sent for post-mortem examination autopsy shall be signed by the investigating police officer of the concerned police station in the form number 85A in cases of death by hanging, strangulation, smothering, the material object used should be sent along with dead body for the purpose of comparison, examination and medico-legal opinion during the post-mortem examination, which shall be sent in the following form number 85A2 and signed by the station house officer or the executive magistrate as the case may be. Where preservation of viscera is required for chemical analysis to confirm the presence of poison or rule out the possibility of associated poisoning, the form number 85A3 shall accompany form number 85A2 which shall also be signed by the station house officer or the executive magistrate as the case may be. The request for post-mortem examination shall go in the form number 85B addressed to the resident medical officer, medical officer, head of the forensic medicine department, government general hospital, etc. This requisition shall be signed by the station house officer or the executive magistrate as the case may be. On arrival at the place where the body of the deceased is lying, the officer making the investigation will firstly prevent the destruction of evidence to the cause of death, prevent crowding round the body and the obliteration of footsteps or other traces or other marks. Before disturbing the body, one must arrange to take the photograph and its immediate surroundings if the nature of the case warrants such action. Investigator must note carefully the location of the body, the position of the limbs, the condition of the wearing apparel and preserve hair, skin, fibers etc. found on the body. If a medical officer or superior police officer is available near the scene and is immediately expected to arrive, it is advisable to keep the body without altering its position until his arrival. When the investigating officer reaches the spot and there is nightfall, but the postponement of investigating over the dead body involves the risk of putrefaction, the investigation over the dead body should be conducted in the night itself with the help of Petromax or other bright lights and any investigation conducted in the night checked up in the morning by observation. Before sending the body for post-mortem, one must take fingerprint impression of the deceased if the body is not decomposed. Let us discuss about investigation of robbery. The importance of robbery resides in its economics, the frequency, the fear created, the potential for violence and its resistance to investigative efforts. Robbery is defined as the illegal taking of something of value from the control, custody or person of another by threatening, putting in fear or using force. Robbery can occur in several contexts including visible street robberies, carjacking, home invasions, truck hijackings and automatic teller machine robberies. Similar to variation by place, robbery styles based on the amount of time planned by the perpetrator to commit the offence may differ. Some robberies occur without essentially any planning while others involve considerable premeditation. Because of the face-to-face -face confrontation between perpetrator and victim, the potential for violence is always present and when it does occur may range from minor injury to the loss of life. Due to the personal and often violent nature, robbery is one of the crimes most feared by the public, a fear that may be heightened by perceptions of police inability to deal effectively with these offences. 
Witnesses are often shaken and see the perpetrator only briefly, sometimes limiting how much they can assist the investigative process. This coupled with the fact that most offenders operate alone can make the robbery investigation extremely difficult in light of the latest identification technologies. However, generating and distributing a likeness of a suspect quickly can mitigate the investigative challenge. When security cameras are present and operating, they can also be of major assistance in providing leads. The investigation of robbery poses many of the problems inherent in person-to-person -person crime. When victims and witnesses are confronted by an armed suspect, their perceptive abilities are diminished. The presence of a weapon further limits perceptions as will any violent action. Since the typical robbery involves a dangerous weapon and an emotionally disturbing atmosphere, the inquiry cannot rely on description as the primary tracing means. Method of operation now. Because the suspect's identity is almost always unknown to the victim, the investigator's first and foremost goal is to find it out. Modus operandi has always been considered a strong tracing element in the robbery investigation. Many criminal groups have fixed methods of operation and robbers tend to develop a methodology early in their careers from which they rarely deviate. Unless a robbery offender becomes aware that a method of operation may provide a tracing clue to uncover identity, the offender will confirm to the actions naturally developed during initial robbery attempts. Regardless of the specific category of the robbery, certain method of operation traits prevail. The great majority of robberies involve the following elements, selection procedure, entry method, initial actions prior to the display of force, display of force, method of acquiring the object of the robbery, actions prior to escape and escape method. The criminal investigator is constantly investigating occurrences after the fact. To develop leads and subsequently learn the offender's identity, the officer should trace the offender's movements from initial to post robbery actions. If the robbery is other than a typical street mugging, the perpetrator will have utilized some selection process. Such procedures range from sophisticated surveillance of a bank to a two-minute observation of a gas station. The question the investigators must attempt to answer is why and how did the robber select this victim or establishment. Resolution is often difficult and the question may remain unanswered unless additional information is developed or the offender is arrested. It may be that the victim was selected by his or her appearance or that the particular store was selected for its locality. If it is believed that pre-robbery surveillance was conducted, a careful neighborhood inquiry should follow. Neighbors, shopkeepers or any person who is usually in that area at the time the robbery took place should be questioned regarding the observation of suspicious persons or automobiles. The success of such neighborhood canva canvases will depend on the accuracy of the descriptions given. Following the selection procedure inquiry, the officer attempts to reconstruct the method of entry. Did the suspect walk into the store without obviously displaying a weapon or did the suspect run through the door with a disguise or mask in place? Next, the perpetrator's action immediately prior to the announcement of the robbery should be determined. Was some stalling type of action involved? Generally, food store robbers pose as customers waiting for the store to empty out. Bank robbers often walk to a table in the center of the lobby and pretend to write a deposit slip or fee in some activity. Such actions are generally quite fixed and will be repeated in successive robberies. The display of force is very important to the modus operandi of the offense. Fortunately, this event in the robbery sequence is one of the most memorable in the mind of the victim. The investigator needs to know how the offender indicated that a robbery was in progress. Did the suspect shove a weapon at the victim and yell, 
this is a hold up or robbery or did the suspect hand a note to the victim remaining silent the manner in which money or property was acquired can normally be described to the investigating officer by the victim in some instances however the suspect forces the victim and witnesses to turn away or to lie face down while the object of the offense is acquired generally the suspect either directs the victim to hand the money over or personally acquires the money or property without assistance the escape actions of the offender are similarly reconstructed after receiving the money from the victim or personally acquiring it did the suspect back toward the door and threaten the victim to stay inside and make no attempt to follow finally a very important method of operation factor and tracing clue must be determined how did the offender flee the immediate scene and neighborhood the victim and or witnesses may be able to provide information in this regard or information may be gained through the initial neighborhood inquiry it is unlikely that the investigator will determine complete answers relative to all seven of these modus operandi elements however any information can help to connect the offense to past or future robberies by comparing and contrasting the modus operandi information gained in a particular case to similar robbery methods the names of prior offenders can be checked as possible suspects in the case in question the use of the computer has fortunately reduced the time required for such checks in many agencies the crime scene is an important starting point in all felony investigations and the robbery inquiry is no exception the value of a given robbery crime scene depends on the actions of the perpetrator before during and after the offense physical traces and clues may be numerous or they may be virtually non existent if it is determined that the suspect posed as a customer and handled merchandise prior to the display of force the items handled should be located and processed if it is determined that the suspect took money from the cash register or was near a showcase these items must also be protected and processed it is unusual that items will be touched by a robber during the escape yet the victim and witnesses should be carefully questioned to determine this all items having even a remote possibility of contact with the robber's person should be examined and processed to determine the presence of fingerprints hairs and fibers blood or other bodily fluids if indicated and soil and footprints certain robbery crime scenes indicate special evidence processing procedures such as a scene in which a firearm has been discharged or a victim was bound now let us talk about follow up investigation the follow up investigation on begins when the investigator leaves the crime scene and terminates when the case is closed or suspended information developed during the method of operation inquiry and the crime scene processing generally determines the success or failure of the continuing investigation if the investigator has a complete and well defined modus operandi to work with a check with other agencies will commence teletype messages will be sent to notify other departments of the offense and to distribute tracing information to other robbery investigators state criminal in identification bureaus should be contacted for state wide method of operation comparisons if the vehicle used during the escape was noted by the victim or witness it may prove to be an important tracing clue Although many robbers steal automobiles to avoid tracing the recovery of the described getaway vehicle is significant when an auto is recovered that matches the description of a suspect's vehicle it should be treated and processed as in any important crime scene many tracing clues may be found in the auto that cannot be located at the robbery scene suspects are generally in the auto longer than they are at the crime scene they also tend to relax following the offense making mistakes that could aid in tracing if an individual remains in an auto for any length of time some evidence will generally be left hairs latent fingerprints 
fibers, money bags, disguises and other items may be located. Amateur robbers sometimes use personal vehicles to escape from the scene. Some will have afterthoughts concerning the possibility of the car being seen and license noted and will report the car stolen to cover the possibility. They reason that if and when a connection is made, they will be free from suspicion by claiming that the auto was used in a robbery during the time it was not in their possession. Accordingly, all stolen auto reports should be reviewed for comparison of the cars with the perpetrator's vehicle. The continuing inquiry will focus on the stolen property that was taken from the scene. If cash was the only item taken, this area of inquiry will be short-lived. Generally, only in bank or large payroll robberies can currency serial numbers is traced. However, many street robberies and some residential and commercial offenses involve stolen property other than cash. The stolen items should be treated as items stolen during thefts and housebreaking in an attempt to locate and trace them to the offender. Investigators often rely upon the information attempting to establish the robber's identity. Since many robbers are inexperienced and tend to be boastful, informant information has traditionally been successful in identifying a significant number of robbery offenders. Let us now talk about investigation of a dacoity. Dacoity means an act of violent robbery committed by an armed gang. There is no difference between robbery and dacoity except in the number of offenders. Robbery is dacoity if the persons committing robbery are five or more in number. The offense of dacoity consists in the cooperation of five or more persons to commit or attempt to commit robbery. It is necessary that all the persons should share the common intention of committing robbery. On a plain reading of section 391 IPC, it would appear that in order that a dacoity can be said to have been committed, it is necessary that five or more persons conjointly commit a robbery or attempt to commit robbery if a robbery was committed. The dacoits would have the valuables with them. But if the matter rested only with an attempt to commit a robbery, there would be no question of the dacoits having any valuables with them. There are three ingredients in dacoity. The accused commits or attempts to commit robbery. Persons committing or attempting to commit robbery and persons present and aiding must not be less than five. All such persons should act conjointly. The word conjointly refers to united or concerted action of five or more persons participating in the act of committing the offence. In other words, five or more persons should be concerned in the commission of the offence and they should commit or attempt to commit robbery. Let us now talk about preliminary investigation of robbery. Investigators should have thorough knowledge of crime by a study of modus operandi and maintaining proper crime maps. Prompt recording of FIR should be done while noting date and time of occurrence, method of approach, entrance and the direction, number of criminals, weapon carried and used, nature and degree of violence or its threat, appearance, dress, dialect, description of the criminals. If the criminals are known or identified, the names, parentage, residence as far could be ascertained. Whether any injury inflicted on any criminal, if so, its position as far as can be ascertained. If identified, means of identification, description of accused identified. Nature and description of articles stolen, whether the inmates can identify them. Articles left by criminals name of witnesses who came, statement before them, gist of statement of culprit, if any arrest at the spot. There should be careful examination of injuries either on culprit or inmates and arranging medical aid for them. One should treat complainant with sympathy and courtesy to enlist his cooperation. 
Now, follow up of the likely places of resort of criminals and the means of retreat like train, bus, boat, etc. should be done. Issue hue and cry notices to bordering police stations and seek the cooperation from bordering police stations and GRPs immediately. What should be done during the examination of the scene? Equip with your investigation outfit, inspect the scene thoroughly and systematically, take photograph from different angles, draw sketch map, look for fingerprints and footprints, develop fingerprints and take casts or trackings or photographs of footprints. Keep a scale by the side of the footprint when taking its photograph. Collect articles left behind by culprits such as cigarette or beeries, ends, shoes, clothes, weapons, empty cartridges, remnants of crackers, blood and blood stains, etc. Look for places of assembly of culprits before occurrence, follow up through line of approach and retreat as far as possible for clues. Collect information such as purchase of abnormal quantity of beads, beetles, drinks, food, stuffs, etc. which indicate the places of association before occurrence and may spot out the local contact of the gang. Camp at the scene fairly long enough to restore the confidence and collect information. Now let us discuss about the investigation of thefts and housebreaking. Thefts and housebreaking represent one of the more common crimes to which patrol officers respond. Someone has returned home from an evening out and found the doors open and their property missing. The police are called and an investigation is begun. Often there are no witnesses to these crimes which make the collection of evidence from the scene even more crucial. It is possible to find a great variety of evidence at thefts and housebreaking scenes if properly searched. What should be kept in mind while approaching the scene unless the crime is known with certainty to be old, officers should respond as if it has just occurred. Often it is the arrival of the owner residents which have caused the theft to flee from the scene. Officers should be aware that the suspects may still be in the area and be alert for suspicious persons as they make their way to the scene. What should be done while securing the scene? Generally, it is not necessary to go to great lengths to secure a theft and housebreaking scene. Ask the victim to avoid handling anything and try to keep them in an undisturbed portion of the scene. Traffic or movement of people through the building should be minimized. In some cases, the victims may have already been through the entire premises and begun to clear, uh, clean up before the police arrive. This makes the location of evidence more difficult. Let us talk about interview of victim. The victim is an important part of investigation. Have the victim walk you through the scene and point out the locations of items which have been disturbed. Now what should be kept in mind while looking for evidence? A rule of thumb for any crime scene is that the best evidence is usually found at the point of greatest activity. At thefts and housebreaking scenes, this is often the place where the suspect gained entry into the building. The point that is the point of entry. One of the first things which need to be determined then is how and where was entry gained. The most common methods are breaking a window or kicking in a door. If some other method of entry is used, make special note of it. Be sure to check all the doors and windows for signs of forced entry. Often a thief may try several doors or windows before finding one they can open. Where did the suspect go inside the scene? In basic terms, where are the items which are missing or disturbed? Look along the routes from the point of entry to the locations of the items. What are the types of evidence found in cases of theft? First are fingerprints. Fingerprints are one of the best forms of evidence at any scene and thefts and housebreaking offer many opportunities for locating prints. The normal method of fingerprint processing at thefts and housebreaking scenes is with fingerprint powder. Powder has been used in crime investigation since the early 1900s. It is cheap and effective. The only materials required are a soft brush, light and dark colored powders and a roll of clear tape. 
Once developed, the fingerprints can be photographed and or lifted with tape. When looking for items to process for latent prints, the rule of thumb is that the more the glass the surface is, the better. Hard, smooth, clean surfaces offer the best chance for locating latent fingerprints. The less smooth the surface is, the less likely it is to yield identifiable prints, with clothes being more or less impossible to recover prints from. Dusting wet or greasy surfaces will result in you ruining your brush. Wet items can be air dried and processed later, while greasy surfaces will require completely different processing technique. There are several new materials available which aid in the recovery of prints from textured surfaces. They don't improve the chances that prints will be left on the surfaces, but they allow you to recover any prints you do find. Look in a current crime scene supply catalog for details. One of the best things about fingerprints at crime scenes is AFIS, the computerized forensic fingerprint database. Crime scene prints of sufficient quality can be searched in the computer and can develop suspects in otherwise cold cases. Second kind of evidence is footwear impressions. Footwear impression can often be found near points of entry either below windows or on doors which have been kicked. With broken windows, it can also be valuable to check the glass on the floor inside the window for impressions. Footwear impression on glass or doors can be recovered using fingerprint powders and lifting tape. Footwear imprints can also be photographed. Use a scale in the photograph so that they can be reprinted actual size. Footwear impression in dirt or snow can be cast. Dental stone is the current casting material of choice. It is usually mixed with water in a large Ziploc bag and poured into the impression. Casting can be rather time consuming but may be required in certain cases. Third kind of evidence are biological fluids. Sometimes evidence left behind by culprits such as saliva on cigarette or BD ends and at mouth of bottles or glass, saliva and bite marks on remnants of food, blood and blood stains on glass panes or other places, urine on toilet seats, etc. may help in DNA analysis which may be compared to DNA database of history sheeters or DNA profiles of suspects. Now to conclude, investigation of various offenses requires a planned and coordinated investigation using both physical evidence and witnesses. Systematic processes using legal and legitimate methods must be used to draw suspects and finally pinpoint the culprit. Thank you.